So we're just going to go through some cases now. We also spoke about overcalling and um, saying that we shouldn't identify things that aren't there. So right, for right away, I just want to speak about this here, this process. Now, if we just look at the lung bases here, there is a sort of increase in density here in the subpleural regions. I know you've all seen it before. What is this? Who knows? Uh, um, I, I don't think I do. Most of us, I think, call this dependent change. I think if we do mention it, we should generally identify it as being normal. So I usually say dependent change, likely not significant, or don't mention it at all. Can this be of pathological significance? In the vast majority of cases, the answer is no. And I think if we see it incidentally on this patient who's uh, come with chest pain, query pulmonary embolus, I think we should ignore it. The only situation where we might take that um, further is if we have a patient with suspected interstitial lung disease, as this can be a very early manifestation of inflammatory interstitial change. And we might wish to do a prone scan in this patient. Usually if you do a prone scan on these patients and it's just the so-called uh, dependent change, it will disappear. So here's a patient who fell down the stairs. Now it's becoming slightly more pronounced. Is this dependent change or is it something more? I don't know. Is it moving towards atelectasis? Because it's not quite subplural. We can see some nice black lung tissue just here in between the area of interstitial change, perhaps we might call this, and the subplural surface. And just to say, what is interstitial change? Interstitial change is an increase in density of the lung parenchyma without disturbance of the underlying architecture. There, there are very many causes. It could be due to acute interstitial inflammation from pneumonia, from a, a viral pneumonia often, and it could be due to a pulmonary embolus causing local flow dynamic problems. Uh, there are very many causes. It could be due to uh, the prelude of inflammatory, inflammatory fibrosis. It could be due to the inflammatory change of a fibrotic process. Uh, so, but what is the significance of this? Is this dependent change or early atelectasis? I don't know, and I think it's rather um, debatable as to which you might wish to call that. It is symmetrical bilaterally, uh, but there is some normal lung tissue between the subpleural area and the abnormality. So this is, I think, the boundary of normality, and I don't really know how to describe it. Here's another patient with some focal interstitial change. Uh, this patient was found in the road. There's an area of interstitial change here, but we're probably just beginning to see some air bronchograms here. Is this consolidation just about to be consolidation? It's hard to know. This patient uh, was quickly discharged afterwards and doesn't have any known respiratory issues. There's possibly some um, interstitial change here. It's quite difficult to say. So there is an area of interstitial change which is sometimes seen on CT scans close to the pleural surfaces and the fissural surface, surfaces particularly, and that's on the edge of normality. Here we are with a patient who's having prostate cancer staging. Um, not staging, uh, the patient was post-treatment and had a rising PSA. So this is just an outpatient with no respiratory symptoms. And you can see the patient has some interstitial change here. And there's some here. And these scans are performed um, often with the patient uh, in continuous gentle breathing or in end expiration because it's not possible for us to um, uh, have the patient maintain an inspiration in a PET scan um, because the PET component of the examination takes about 20 minutes to acquire and no one can hold their breath for that long. So when you report a lot of PET scans, you do see that this sort of interstitial pattern is quite common. And I wonder if a lot of the patients that we scan um, aren't actually holding their breath perfectly 
during the examination and produces that interstitial appearance which is on the borderline of normality so i just think that's something to something to think about when you're um doing your uh, reporting so here's a patient who fell off his uh, sedgeway so presumably just a fall from a standing height what do we call this area down here a localized area of linear density probably here we're talking about atelectasis I would say this is the early sign of atelectasis a rather linear density here's a patient who fell into a grain silo um, and um, this was called consolidation but I wonder if the reporter was under some pressure to do so there were no associated rib fractures is this an area of consolidation well the air bronchograms here to me look quite clustered and um, I'm thinking this is more an area of uh, atelectasis but I admit it's quite difficult now let's look at this patient so this patient we're not aware of any particular trauma the, uh, um, apart from the fact that they sustained burn, uh, serious burns and had to be intubated at the scene this patient has a pattern at the lung bases which I hope you'll think is very similar to the last one you saw that area of um, a pacification at the left base was a consolidation was it atelectasis I think this is atelectasis here because it's a bilateral symmetrical process and the patient didn't have any history of trauma I don't have any reason from looking at the notes to think that the patient had pneumonia and I don't have any reason to think that they had a pulmonary contusion so my feeling is this is atelectasis I feel it's very similar to the last patient and uh, so I think that's what we should call it we should call this this bibasal atelectasis we shouldn't call it consolidation and we shouldn't call it contusions here's a patient who fell from standing so again not a huge trauma um, this also I would personally call bilateral basal atelectasis you can see depression of the left oblique fissure there and again the air bronchograms are rather all the, and the bronchi here are um, th this air bronchogram and these bronchi are rather clustered together so my feeling is that this here with its characteristic location the same on the other side this is most likely to be bibasal atelectasis now this patient had left, plank, left flank pain and fever we can see some irregular areas of opacification here in the right lower lobe this one here is most prominent it does have rather regular margins over most of it I admit it's a bit smooth here but this looks quite regular and it doesn't look like it's losing any volume there's a couple of other areas with irregular margins next to it so this I would call an area of consolidation here's uh, what I would consider to be a much more severe area of consolidation and I think I'm, I'd be fairly uh, confident about this because this patient did have a fever and um, did have significant respiratory symptoms and improved with antibiotics so here we have a large area of opacification which has air bronchograms which are separated and um, uh, this was a patient who had a, a clinical appearances of um, pneumonia that's uh, acute, acute myeloid fever, acute myeloid leukemia with fever is the clinical history here. Here's a patient with prostate cancer who's short of breath. So there's an irregular margin to the abnormality here. Certainly this is more smooth, but I think you can, you might probably agree, this is just due to the presence of the oblique fissure on this side. There's um, volume preservation in this area of pacification and this is a patient with consolidation now one thing that's quite useful is nowadays we're able to reconstruct our images as we wish and you can get a better impression of whether or not there's volume loss in the abnormality by doing so 
and we've reconstructed this in the coronal plane. Our images have, we have standard reconstructions in the coronal and sagittal plane, so there's no excuse not to look. And we can see that the volume here is preserved. And we can also see some nice air bronchograms uh, as well. So this is a patient with um, consolidation. Here we have another case of consolidation. Preserved volume here. And here we have a patient with collapse, where we've got some loss of volume, so the abnormality is telescoped into a rather small and narrow area. It's also got very smooth margins. And you can see the same phenomenon, just as an aside, with lymph nodes. So we look at this lymph node here, for example. On a single size, it looks like it might be quite large. But when we look we look at the scanogram, we look at the, sorry, at the correlating image on the coronal plane, we can see it's actually a very thin lymph node. Just we happen to slice it in uh, a favorable plane, so it was demonstrated to be uh, quite large in that specific plane. And we can do the same with, we might have the same issues with collapse and consolidation. An area of, of atelectasis or collapse might look quite large on a single image, but when we look at it on another plane, it's um, narrow uh, configuration might be better appreciated. So here's a patient with small cell lung cancer and we can see extensive mediastinal and right hilar lymphadenopathy which is a common presentation. There was no peripheral primary lung lesion seen here and that's just the uh, lung tissue showing no abnormality in the lung periphery uh, at presentation. So the patient received radiotherapy treatment and three months after the radiotherapy treatment we can see extensive consolidation in the paramediastinal lung parenchyma at around the area where the therapy was given. Now you can see that there's a rather smooth border here at this margin just beginning to form. That's due to the radiotherapy field. But because this is an area of acute radiotherapy change from and consolidation, we can see that the air bronchograms are nicely spaced out. And a couple of months later, we can see that the margins are still well defined, conforming to the radiotherapy treatment portal. This abnormality will probably shrink down over time as the tissues fibrose and contract. Here's a patient with cough and a tender abdomen. They were just scanned as an abdominal patient by the surgeons. And uh, there was an incidental discovery of um, pneumonia here. So a volume taking process in the right lower lobe. And that's the end of part two. So we have more cases to look at in part three. Thank you.